Good evening. No, this isn't Alfred Hitchcock. This is Matt of Post April 6th YouTube channel. However, I am going to talk about Alfred Hitchcock. I've admired him since I was 10 years old. The first movie I saw of him is still an epic movie. It's still a classic and has definitely stood the test of time and is still seen 63 years later after it was released to the public and 64 years after uh, Hitchcock got the movie rights after he read the book that, uh, that um, was written by Robert Block, which is where the phrase psycho came from, and where the book that was written by Alfred Hitchcock, he called it psycho, meaning psychotic, meaning seriously deranged, mentally ill, and, and, one, and a person that one, most people would want to stay away from if they knew how sick he was meaning how bad Norman Bates was. As I uh, sit here, smoking my beautiful freehand pipe, yep, and inside the pipe is Edwards Buccaneer Blend. And it's not some I'm familiar with, it's, it seems more like an aromatic tobacco, but it's smoking good. Anyways, back to Alfred Hitchcock and the movie Psycho. Um, I did some research before, before I uh, did the filming, and the rights to acquire the rights to the novel to turn it into a movie Back in 1959, the exact date of when this happened, um, I don't know. I would assume it would have been before November of 1959 when the filming began. When it was specifically, uh, the best guess I can make is probably somewhere between um, August and... Um, mid-October of 1959, not 1960, 1959. And uh, why don't I um, give some information about the film first before I talk about the book. Okay, the filming began in November 11th, 1959. And what scene was filmed first, um, I don't know. I would assume that it had something to do with the uh, helicopter that was doing the sky view of um, Phoenix. And then they do a close up of the hotel room they're referring to and the actual, hot the, the actual hotel or motel scene was not filmed inside um, that location in Phoenix, Arizona. It was filmed inside a soundstage. And you know, them soundstage, soundstage people, they can, they can design things so well that you actually think it's inside a hotel instead of inside of a soundstage. You, you, know, you guys know what I mean. The average person would know. And um, the shower scene itself, I think it took at least six to seven days to film it. And the number of takes that were done, um, I've heard several different stories of it, but I would assume, I would assume it was at least 30 takes.
and um, the people that starred in the movie weren't, wasn't just Anthony Perkins and uh, Janet Lee. It were these actors. Vera Miles, John Gavin, John McIntyre, Janet Lee, and there was one guy who we all know pretty well, but back then he was a nobody. He played the guard that guard the, guarded the um, door of the um, of the holding cell or the, 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 the mental institution, you know, padded cell type place that was within the county, um, Fairvale County or whatever, Fairvale uh, City or County Jail. And he stood guard over that door. Who I'm referring to is Ted Knight, the man who was um, a key player as a news anchorman and pretty um, debonair and uh, funny in uh, Mary Tyler Moore show. And he also played the the really um, persuasive and um, caring father in Too Close to Comfort. And quite unfortunately, somewhere between 1985 and 1987, Ted Knight passed away from colon cancer. Yeah. Um, the film, the the filming of the movie ended on February first, nineteen sixty, and what they did was, is they they did the whole entire process of putting the film together, and they recorded um, Bernard Herrmann doing the the, um, the soundtrack. And um, the release date of the movie was, and this was in New York City only, was in was on June sixteenth, nineteen sixty. And it aired there for a while. And then what happened was was nationwide. It was available after September eighth, nineteen sixty. Somewhere in that time. Um, I wasn't alive back then because that was 13 years before I was born. My father, who was then um, just a few days away from turning 16 years old, saw it at, at um, a movie theater in Seward, Nebraska. And my mother saw the film um, at a movie theater that was probably somewhere near downtown Littleton or nearby in um, that immediate area of the Denver metro area near Littleton. And she was 20 years old at the time. She was, see, she was born in 1940. My father was born in 1944. He was four years younger. And I remember my mother telling me over and over again that she was really, really scared and nervous when she drove home from the movie theater back to her parents' house because she lived with her parents at the time. She was really scared. Um, the budget for the film was $806,000. The box office earnings, because this pop, this movie was such a great big hit, and everybody and their brother wanted to see it. Fifty million dollars. 
what that e equates to nowadays. The best guess I can make is probably over $40 million. Probably over $60 million. Or no, 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 no. I misspoke. Shame on me. Probably over uh, $400 million. Probably. The running time for the film was an was 109 minutes and that would be 12 minutes shy of two full hours 60 plus 60 minutes plus 60 minutes equals 120 and when you're 12 minutes short of uh, one, 120 minutes it therefore means longer than an hour and a half more like an hour and or 1.9 1.95 hours roughly okay so here is the book this is a 1997 version where everything is the same but here's what it looks like on the front. And here is about how it looks on the back. I'm going to have to cover up this because I don't want to get burned for uh, revealing something, revealing a sticker that I'm not supposed to be revealing. There's a spinal. And here, let's, let's do it this way. And like this. This book was um, published in 1959. The exact release date of when this movie was, was released, I don't know. Um, it says the first edition was published in, is copyright 1959, the first published in Great Britain. This is United, also known as United Kingdom, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, would be in 1960. And the number of pages in this book are 153 pages. Now here is what I know to the best of my knowledge that is different about the book versus the movie. In the movie, Mary, uh, Mary Crane, what's this called Mary Crane? In the book, in the movie she was called Marion Crane. And she had a boyfriend prior to uh, Sam Loomis named Dale Belter. I think what happened was he served in World War II and then he um, he just he just drift they just they just faced each other out. And in both the movie and the book, she worked for the Lowry Real Estate Agency, or Lowry Real Estate. And in the um, movie and in the book, The man who had the hundred thousand, uh, the forty thousand dollars he was, he was using to uh, buy his daughter a house, as a wedding present. Were the same uh, character.
And um, I don't remember personally off the top of my head what the the character name was of of the, of the millionaire. And in both both times, the the the, the millionaire was uh, you know the oil lease man. I think he was named Mr. Uh, Mr. Cass. Uh, yeah, Mr. Cassidy was his was his name. Mr. Cassidy. I just remembered that. He was an oil lease man. He made big, big bucks. Not just a million. Uh, probably more like ten million, twenty million dollars. Twenty million dollars then was the equivalent to having over seven hundred million dollars now. You know, as far as the buying power and, you know, the ranking high up as far as how how much of a millionaire he was. In the book, um, Mary Crane was seen by her landlord getting in the car and driving away to go to Fairville, California. In the movie, Marion Crane was seen by the big man himself, her boss, Mr. Lowry. He just happened to walk past while she was waiting at an intersection for the for the street for the for the go light to go the direction she was going to head towards uh, Fairville, California. And in the book, she changed cars twice, meaning she had three different cars. One, the car that she originally owned, and then she bought another one, and then she traded again, and then bought another one that was just a, it had some, it had some dents in it, and it was kind of a, a jalopy, a, a clunker. In the book, or excuse me, in the movie, in the movie, she only changed cars once. And that was actually at uh, a street called Lancashire, and it was OK Used Cars. It was an OK Used Car dealership. In the in the um, movie, or excuse me, in the book, she drove straight through. Or no, wait a minute. In the book, she didn't drive. Yes, that's right. That's right. In the book, she drove straight through. And she didn't stop once. And she spent eighteen hours or seventeen hours in a row driving, nonstop. Now, if this was real life, did she stop at one point? Probably. One, to get gas. Two, to get a snack or something to eat. And three, to go, go potty. You know, even, even, even the toughest women can't hold it for over 18 hours. Well, most of them can't anyway. <laughs> Enough about that uh, private stuff. Really private stuff. And in the movie, she stopped in an area that we didn't know about. It was called Gorman Post Road. And she, she laid down in the front seat, seat and she, she slept for uh, probably at least uh, five to six hours. How long she actually slept? I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what. Uh, what the way the acting was. What what the what the viewer would anticipate. You know, everybody's got their own opinion about how long she slept in there. And then after she slept, and then after she um, cooperated the best she could with the police officer, and the police officer gave her her, 
driver's license back, and then she drives to where she's supposed to drive to to do to do the car to do the car switch, so that she can't be tailed as easily. That was the whole idea why she did the car switch. In the book, after she changed cars tw at least twice, three, you know, she she was she went through three cars altogether. One, the one, the the car she originally owned, and then she did the switch, the first switch, and then she did the second switch, and then she got to Fairvale. Um, it was not raining out, or at least I don't think so. And then uh, she pressed a special signal button instead of honking on the horn like in the movie. Because in the movie she honked on the horn, and in the book she just she just pressed a button. And then she and, and in the book what was going on with Norman was Norman was having a uh, a typical clinging, demanding. Uh, <laughs> conversation with his mother <laughs> when what was really truly going on was you know he would he would talk in his mother's voice and then answer in his own and then talk in his mother's voice again and answer in his own it was it was one of those multi, it was one of those highly complex multiple personality psychotic uh, syndrome things and the what happened in the movie after she gets checked in, she lays her, uh, she, she puts up, she unpacks part of her luggage, and um, she, was in, she was invited to go um, have dinner. In, in, in the book, I believe that the, the, the sandwich that they had, the cold cut sandwiches they had, was inside the house. In the movie, they ate in the parlor behind the, the front desk area of the, uh, you know, the office parlor in the, behind the front desk area of the uh, motel. You know, the check-in, check-out area. And in the book, um, Norman Bates takes a coffee mug and goes, Psh! and he knocks up and goes, "She's not crazy," and he and, he's, and he gets all, he all yells at her. In the movie, with the, with you know again with the with the taking place in the um, in the in the office partner. He's, uh, he's he, he has some restraint, and he just says, you mean an institution? A madhouse? And um, what happened in the um, movie, when the, when, the, when the conversation, or excuse me, in the book, the book, I keep getting that messed up, in the book, she... Um, when the conversation ended, he was a, was a good gentleman. He helped her on with her coat, and then they go down the the, the the pitch black area to the hotel, and he has the flashlight. And in the movie, she just simply walks from the office over to cabin one. And then she does some mathematics because what she wants to do is take money out of her savings account and pay the $700 she took out of the pile of money that contained the uh, $40,000 that she stole. And she was going to withdraw that from the bank, put it back, put the, put the money in the put the $40,000 in the safe deposit box, come into work, and even though she'd be dead tired, you know, she was, you know, no, no, there was none the wiser, and she was, 
every and she was going to live happily ever after, even though she was going to be dead tired. But we all know what happened in the movie. Norman Bates turned into his mother, and he went on a, went in on, on a personal blackout, and he stabbed her to death. Now the differences between the shower scene in the book and in the movie. Okay, in the book, what happened was, is the first thing that happens when Norman slash Norma opens up the shower curtain is no, uh, Mary notices that he that 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 uh, there's a bunch of fake makeup on his on the face and then she screams and he he's and he stabs her several times and he does one of these <coughs> he literally if he literally either decapitated her or he came awful close kind of like a certain somebody who who abruptly was murdered back in 1994 and no I'm not going to say the name of who that was because I don't want to all of a sudden wind up getting ran over and killed. It happened, you know, I got ran, I got hit by a car before and by golly, I don't want to go through that again. Christ saved my life from death for a reason. That's all I'll say about that. Okay, so what happens is, is in the, in the book, Um, Norman discovers that she is still taking a shower after he had quite a few drinks and he and he got drunk and he passed out for a, for a, for at least a half hour to an hour and then he goes he he, he peeks through the his little peephole and he sees uh, he sees traces of red, and then he goes in there and he sees that she is uh, murdered and he, and he vomits. In the book, you after Mary, Marion Crane is murdered, you see, oh God, mother, blood, blood. And then he comes running down those, those distinct uh, set of, of uh, outdoors, outer stairs or catwalk or whatever. And uh, then he goes in, checks the house, and goes, because he almost vomits. In the mo in the book, he actually did vomit, and then he cleaned, and then and then he changed clothes, and then he comes back into like a you know, bib overalls or something like that, and he he does all the cleaning. And even while he's doing the cleaning, he's all, you know, he's 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 fighting, he's 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 withholding the urge to throw up. You know, he's he's fighting it. Um, let's see, in the movie or in the book. After um, after Lila, the sister, comes knocking on the door wall, Sam is in his little uh, back room area that he has converted into an office slash his own little itty bitty house, you know, makeshift house, with like one uh, with a one burner uh, hot plate or something like that or an itty bitty stove, whatever, to do some cooking. Uh, she comes in and she starts to ask him, and then all of a sudden, because the door was unlocked, you know, again, this is in the book, Milton Arbogast, or Detective Arbogast, informs us, you can hear him say, that's what I'd like to know, in a, in a, in a cold monotone. In the movie, 
you just you just you see a more you don't see a southerner you see kind of an east east coast easterner new yorker whatever east eastern united states type guy dressed the way actor martin martin balsam was he says well forty thousand dollars and then john gavin who's playing san louis says Forty thousand, and then he looks at both of them and says, well, "One of you better tell me what's going on and go tell me fast. I can take just so much." And he goes, "Take it." And then Balsam says, "Or uh, not Balsam, uh, Milton Harbigas says, it's just take it easy, take it easy. Your girlfriend stole forty thousand dollars.'" In the book, what happens is, is he he, he gives forth a lot of information. To say, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't get a phone call from her. He says, I, I, I didn't take, make or receive any long distance phone calls. He says, Sunday morning I went to the church, and then I went to the lodge hall and I played cards, and then I did this, and then I did that, and then, and then, uh, Milton Arbogast or Detective Arbogast says, okay, 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 I believe you. Okay, so then what happens is, is in the, um, movie we see, we then see, um, Arbogast driving around and checking out hotels, room for rent places, and all types of, uh, ho different types of hospitality. In the book, both Lila Crane and Sam Loomis were waiting at the hardware store while the store was open. And they kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And just when they were getting ready to call the police because they hadn't heard back from Arbogast, the phone rings. And Arbogast tells Sam that he thinks he's got a lead and he's going to question Norman Bates. This was in the book. In the movie, in the movie, he questioned Norman Bates. And then he goes to a payphone and he, call, he, he calls and tells uh, Lila instead of uh, instead of Sam Loomis what's going on because Lila answered the phone or no actually Sam Loomis answered the phone then he handed the phone over to, to Lila Crane in the book he could he, before they go to the sheriff's office, he um, Sam Loomis takes a drive in his truck, and he goes all the way out there, and he pounds on the front door of Norman Bates's house instead of what happened in the movie. When the movie was he comes, he parks near the front entrance area to the office, and then you. In, in, in the movie you hear uh, let, um, Sam Lewis go Arbogast 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 and Norman Bates is, had, had just ditched the remains and the and the and the car that uh that uh, Arbogast drove into, he, he, he dumped it in the swamp. And he's standing there after the, the, the swamp dumping was done, and he's all gone. Like he's all paranoid that they know.
and in the um, in the book after he does a 42 minute drive out there and back he stops somewhere and he gets a quick and I mean quick uh, order at the at a diner or at a restaurant or at a drive-in and what it is is it's um, is two cheeseburgers, fries, and um, I think there might have been a uh, a little a little cup of uh, you know like an ice cream entree. I don't I don't know that for sure. I think that's what they were referring to, but I'll have to go back and read the book again. And in the book versus the movie, after they could not get through to the sheriff um, because the sheriff was involved in a bank robbery investigation in a place called in a town called Fulton which was one of the places in uh, Fairvale or Parnassus or whatever it was called um What they, what they do is they wait till the next day and they go to the sheriff's office and they say to one of the guys who's an old guy, probably in his 50s, early 60s, he's a deputy sheriff, whatever, or a sergeant, whatever. And he says, uh, he, the, the sheriff, the, the guy responds, he says, he says, well, I intended to today uh, when he comes in, you know, about the, the message that, that they left the night before. And then he says, he says, where, where is he? He says, he says, he says, well, it's Sunday morning. He, he's probably over the church. And he says, and then Sam asks, what church? He says, First Baptist. And then they go, they go racing out of there, and they're and they're and they're like running. And they said, you and, and you hear the the sheriff deputy or the the sergeant. He says, you wouldn't go pull him out of. And they and they drive over to the church and they talk with uh, talk with the sheriff and explain what's going on. In the movie, it's. Uh, a little, there's not, it's not as complicated. What happens is, is instead of the, the, the sheriff being Judd Chambers, he's Al Chambers in the, in the movie. They, they drive to his front door and, and the wife puts on her house, you know, her, the house coat over the nightgown and the, and the sheriff puts on his, uh, his uh, bathrobe over the over the pajamas, and uh, he explains every uh, Sam and uh, Lila do, do do their explaining of what happened and, and why they they want him they want Norman Bates questioned. And all that happens is, at the time, is they, um, is the sheriff calls Norman Bates after he gets, for, the, the call gets arranged by the, the local operator, and he asks him all about it, and then after the conversation ends, and the uh, the sheriff hangs up the phone. He says, "Your detective was there. Norman told him about the girl. The detective thanked him, and he went away. And in the in the movie, you hear you hear Lila say, and he didn't come back, and he didn't talk about the money. He says, and then the sheriff says, your detective told you." about talking, wanting to talk to Norman Bates' mother, right? And then, and then Lila says, yes. The sheriff says, 
Norman Bates' mother has been dead and buried in Green Lawn Cemetery for the past 10 years. Here's what the book says about how long ago uh, Norman Bates' mother's been dead and buried. 20 years. Yep. Okay, enough about that. Here's the difference of what Norman Bates looked like in the book, according to the way to describe it. He's overweight. He always had at least three to five days worth of stubble on his face, kind of, kind of like a one of those. Uh, well, I mean, it was it was unclassy back then, but if you were actor Don Johnson, you look like you, you, you kind of looked like Sonny Brunette in the TV, in, in the episodes of Miami Vice. But, uh, and the other thing was, is uh, Norman, in the, in the book, Norman Bates had, had, had uh, glasses kind of like, you know, those granny glasses, kind of like what John Lennon had. But in the, in the movie, John, or excuse me, Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates, Norman Bates was thin, he was in shape, he didn't. He wasn't the type that drank liquor at all. He seemed like just a, a lovable, innocent choir boy. But we all know in real life he was Norman Bates. The way Norman Bates was portrayed in the movie, Norman Bates in real life was really sick, 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 sick. and he wasn't a God-fearing man. He was, he was like a, he was, he was possessed by the devil. Yep. Okay, um, here's, here's one more comparison before I talk about something else. In the, um, uh, book, The sheriff talks, gives a fairly detailed discussion after the sheriff actually went out to the house and went over every nook and cranny of the, you know, the hotel, the, 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 the surrounding property, the inside of the house, everything. But in the movie, that didn't happen. It was because Sam Loomis and Lila LaCrane, after talking to the uh, sheriff at the, at the at the church, after he after he discussed it, he just gave kind of a short but uh, precise response because he went out there before he went to church that day. Uh, what happened was is Norman is is Lila Crane. And Sam Lewis drove out there, and they they started doing some digging on their own, and then all of a sudden, Norman Bates dresses up like his mother, and he tries to kill Lila Crane, but it backfired because Sam Lewis was only knocked out unconscious for few short minutes and then he goes running in there and he he goes running down the stairs and he grabs Norman Bates's arm and he he, he he incapacitates him and he keeps twisting the arm like this you know like until the and until the knife drops and then and then the next thing we see in the movie is the psychologist's analysis of what really is going on with Norman Bates because the first thing he says before he confirms the fact that Marion Crane was murdered and so was the private investigator, he said, 
I got the whole story, but not from Norman. I got it from his mother. It was because <clears throat> Norman Bates had, had changed personalities completely to the point where he, he, he became his mother. And he had the voice of his mother, the whole thing. Um, I did do a YouTube search. There are a few movie clips that have the actual Psycho 1960. Some of the movie scenes were colorized, but not every single one of them. And it's, it's interesting to see the colors of the way people dress and I think it's probably accurate, but at the same time, eh, it's better that it, it, the movie stayed the way it orig originally was. And here's one more thing that happened in 2020 when it was the uh, 60th anniversary of the making of the movie Psycho out on Blu-ray. It's uncut, and you see more uh, cleavage on uh, Marion Crane as she's getting undressed and getting ready to take a shower. Yeah. You you only see it really briefly, but yeah, you see more cleavage, more nudity. Yeah, I here's here's a here's a personal account about the movie. When I went to go see it for the first time, I did not see it in a uh, movie theater. Uh, I saw it on a 25 inch Zenith color TV. That was one of those console TVs that sat down like this. And and uh, was the picture quality as good as the 720 or the 1080 high def televisions and, and the smart TVs? No. But it was pretty good for the time. Yeah, that TV that my dad had uh, was worth $700. And how he obtained it for free, I better not say. Because if I do, my dad's going to go to me. I mean, physically will he do it? No. But verbally, he'll really, he'll really chew me out up one side and down another. Can't say a word about it. Can't. It was given to him because, well, let's just say somebody owed him a favor. Oh, yeah. And more than just one favor. Okay, so, in March or early April of 1994, 1989, 1984, I almost said 1994, in March or April, or late March or early April of 1984, me and Dad saw that movie, and uh, we watched it together after he saw the evening news and he sat in his recliner chair and I sat a little over this way on the couch and we just uh, watched the whole thing and after that movie aired I was so worried I was going to have a very bad nightmare. And as it turned out, I didn't. But uh, the, the time that this, the, the, the day of the week that this movie aired uh, was either a Wednesday night or a Thursday night, or possibly a Friday night. And the next day for me, this is what my dad still had his own decent repair business before he had to shut things down because he was tired of the, the battle. 
of running a diesel repair business. And the economy was getting in bad shape. And he knew he had to shut it down and go find a regular good paying job as a master uh, professional diesel mechanic, which he did a couple months after he shut the business down. This is in 1985 when he found a, a good paying job. So anyways, the, the business was still open in March of 84. And I steam cleaned something that my dad said it was okay to clean up. And I was using a professional grade ZEP uh, power washer, or, steam, or back then we called them steam cleaners. And the whole time I'm going, I just kept looking over my shoulder like this. Because I was worried what was going to happen was some uh, five points. This is because at, at the location where the shop was, it was not far away from Five Points, uh, Denver. That some Five Points dirty gangbanger thug was going to come up, come up after me and and pretend to stab me just as a way of scaring me and making me feel intimidated as a way of pulling some type of uh, gang initiative, initiation prank. That never happened. Nobody snuck in on me. All it was was just my own imagination getting the best of me. That's all it was. Um, and there would be times when I heard a car drive by really fast and then I wake up and the way the wind's blowing I'm just laying there like and, I, and I'm trying to get back to sleep I mean I was, I was only 10 years old it was, it was typical child childlike uh, fears that that happen. It's it's normal that kids have those type of fears. And before I end the end the vlog, here is what the VHS tape looks like. This is a 1990 version of the 40th anniversary of Psycho. And here's what it looks like on the back. Because, as I've said before, I am, I am a VCR junkie. I like this movie. I really like it. I did the best I could. Excuse me a second. I did the best I could to explain this movie. And one last thing before I go. If any of you are would like to know if any of the staff, or excuse me, the movie stars, are still alive, there's only one left, and it is Vera Miles, and Vera Miles is at least 93 years old, and. Based on what I have heard, I believe she lives in Big Bear Lake, California. Yeah. And she's not uh, a hardcore liberal Democrat. She's a conservative Republican. But uh, she's with a uh, religion that I don't, I don't approve of. Uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the, the Mormon Church. I, I, don't, I don't agree with their false doctrine. I really don't. I'm not going to say anything more. I, I just don't. And I think that for the most part, even though she's quite old, and she, she, she probably doesn't talk as much because as when people get in their late 90s, sometimes the way they talk, their, their voice is so aged it's, it's hard for them to it's hard for them to talk. It happens, even to the best of people. 
And uh, if I ever see her someplace, will I be nice to her? Yes. But will, if she tries to invite me to go to uh, an LDS church, not going to go. I'm showing Christ our Savior quite a, di quite a bit of disrespect by doing that. Not going to do it. Well, this is quite a long video. It's almost an hour long by now. And I appreciate everybody uh, letting me do this vlog. Thank you, everybody. I hope everybody has a Merry Christmas. And the vlog is now over. And thank you very much. And God bless America. Goodbye.